Um, well, then we will start our meeting. It's after six o'clock, so it's the time for the meeting. Call the uh, meeting to order. Uh, roll call. I guess we'd just show that uh, Rochelle is here and all the other directors are present. And uh, we have one public hearing, which is a variance request. No, you meant Carla. Sorry, Carla. I'm here. Right? You're here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's been a long I was going to say it's something. It's a long day. <laughs> It is. So this evening we're bringing a variance request from the district's metering policy um, to you for some residents on Ventana Court. We have Mr. Zahorski and a couple of his neighbors mm -hmm. who have one inch meters that were installed in 1986. Um, I've included the original service installation order for Mr. Zahorski's service as well as the water waiver that was signed at the time the uh, service was installed. Um, he did pay for the one inch meter, which was different from the five eighths inch monthly fixed service charge up until 2013. After 2013, when we did that rate study, those were standardized for single family residential customers. And this last rate study that we did, um, the rate consultant advised us to go back to charging um, all of our customers based on meter capacity. So those one inch service charges did change uh, under our last rate study that was done in 2019. And it resulted in a significant increase in the one inch um, monthly service charge. So Mr. Zahorski has applied for a variance from the metering policy. His uh, residence does sit at elevation above the meter and above the, the main that runs through the street. He was provided a one inch meter at the time it was installed to allow uh, for reduced head loss and more pressure up at his up, hip, uh, up at his residence. However, we've got a number of customers in the district that have a similar configuration who have put in booster pumps and black flow devices to meet that um, same capacity with a smaller meter. So um, staff's recommendation at this time is to go ahead and deny the request for variance because um, the service was installed back in 1986. A water waiver was signed at that time by the applicant acknowledging that that was a low water pressure situation. We have offered to provide him at no charge under the meter variance policy, with policy that we have in place, a smaller 5 8 inch meter on a trial basis. Um, Mr. Sahorsky has not been interested in doing so. Um, as well as uh, the option to install a uh, uh, booster pump and backflow device to improve his pressure and use a 5 8 inch meter. So we're recommending that the, the variance be denied under those terms. Any directors have questions of staff? I do, yes. So uh, just clarification. So with a 5 8 inch meter and a booster pump, that would be adequate pressure? It should be, yeah. And then, and you said that there are a number of customers in our district that have that situation? A number of our customers in our district that have various meter sizes and have installed booster pumps because their home does not get the water pressure that they desire. Okay, thank you. I don't know whether to have public comment first or okay. questions. Well, if you have questions of staff, we could do that now. But otherwise, uh, we can certainly do it after. After you. Um, how, many, how many of the... Uh, one inch meters require a booster pump? I don't know. We identified, I believe it was 278 one inch meters at the time, 258 one inch meters at the time we um, evaluated our, our meter variance policy. However, we have no idea what the reason for the one inch meters are. So I don't, I don't know how many of those one inch meters have booster pumps. I don't know if that's something that Engineering could answer. You guys test the backflows on those? That's in progress. Now. Okay, so I, I wouldn't have that information available right now. Okay, so you don't know how unique. And you said this was a metering policy? It's a, it's a policy for the cost for service based on the meter size. So that, that's a metering policy? Well, the metering policy is that the district is required to provide a certain pressure at the, at the meter location. Mm -hmm. We're not mandated to provide a certain pressure at the residence. And so this, this meter that is installed at, at the Ventana Court address does meet the terms of that policy. We are meeting the okay. minimum pressure requirements at the meter. 
Um, so the variance request is to continue to use a one inch meter, but to pay a four or five eighths inch service charge rather than a one inch service charge. And we've got a lot of customers in the district who may or may not feel that they're getting full capacity off their meter for a variety of reasons. Uh, this just kind of opens up a can of worms. And the, the, but there is a variance for fire. There is a variance for the fire service. We do have customers who were required to put in a one inch meter in order to meet private fire suppression requirements by the fire district. Mm -hmm. So they weren't really given a choice in the matter. They had to install the one inch meter. Then the fire district changed their uh, configuration to a two inch service with a five eighths inch bypass meter. So those customers are being charged for five eighths inch water service plus a two inch fire service. It seemed appropriate in this instance to charge these one inch customers for five eighths inch water service and a one inch fire service. And so they the, the cost for the meter is based on the capacity of the meter. Right. So in the, in the, the logic for the fire is that there's not a fire all the time. Right. So that it wouldn't tax, we don't have to size our system to be able to, to, to provide that capacity all the time. It's just- Not all the time, just in fair. an unusual situation. Yeah. It seems reasonable to me. Okay. Anything else? All right, that's being the case. I'll open the public hearing and receive public uh, testimony. Yeah, first of all, I want to state um, that this is not just about me. We have three different homes that are in this situation. Um, we actually had a meeting a few nights ago where three of us got together. The other, one of the other neighbors is here. The other one, unfortunately, is on a red eye right now in New York City, or he was going to be here today. Um, in regards to this, this is a very unique situation. We are not the same as most of these others. I want to make that very clear. There are three other roads that come off of Mesa Drive that go up the hill that require, that have these pressure drops. In every single case, SoCal Water Creek District put a main line up and put the meter at the person's property line as it states that it should be. For some reason, I have no idea why, ours are down on Mesa. And that's the crux of this whole problem. And so what happened is, for some reason, the meters were put down there, unlike Lynette Drive or Sunset or Viewpoint, all these private roads, you guys put the meter up and you put the meters right at the person's property line as it states you should. For some reason, ours are not at our property lines. Ours are like 100 feet down the hill, okay? And then what you did is you put it in a one inch meter to help supplement that. And it's been borderline just enough for it to get by. There's a lot of inaccuracies in this memo that presented. We didn't refuse 5 eighths. We talked to Ron about 5 eighths. We talked to Taj about it. They all agreed it won't work. Okay, it, we could, I mean, if you wanna put it in there and take it out, that's fine. We can show that it won't work. One of the things that we did, and we've been working with SoCal Water Creek District for the past year, trying to resolve this and waiting for documentations and working with them. One of the things that we did is we did run a test to see what our capacity is since we're supposedly charged by capacity and you have to build your system, which we understand, to meet the dem demands of capacity. And for a one-inch meter, you should get 50 gallons per minute. We're getting 12.7, okay? A 5.8, you should be getting 20. So we're not even getting the capacity of a 5.8 meter, okay? We're only getting two-thirds of the capacity of a 5.8 meter, and 25% of that of a 50, okay? And yet we're being charged for the capacity. So, and it's all because, again, it, because it was decided that long ago to put something down there. So, you know, we look at this in, as a situation where we are a very unique situation, okay? Mm -hmm. And you say, well, the one inch people with the fire suppression, they had to have it, you know, because the fire department said so. It doesn't matter if the fire department, the county permit department, you guys, anybody says that their needs are. The bottom line is that they, um, they had a decision to either build the house, not build the house, do the remodel, not do the remodel. But they decided to do it, and therefore they put a one inch in. Same as us. We had to do it, we had to put a one inch in to make ours function, okay? And therefore it went ahead and you know, we were able to do it. The only thing is we're not getting the capacity like they are. Now I understand if we had a meter at our property line and we decided to build on our five acre, five acre lot way up on the hill and we said, hey, our pressure is low, you guys go, too bad, you gotta put a booster pump in. I get that, that makes total sense. But that's not the situation here, and it's been like this for over three decades. Uh, ignore that. <laughs> okay. um, and as I said, I we, really, we, really, we really want to resolve this today, mm -hmm. and I think we are a very special situation, and in this letter that was put together, 
they list off four different situations for this one inch meter that you guys came up with. And I understand that. You said, hey, we have to look at everyone. And even though we've got 15,000 people or however many it is, uh, we found 258 accounts. We need to address this. What are we going to do? And you took the time to go through this and you came up with four situations here that you installed it to meet fire suppression, that you have more than one unit going to it, um, that it could have been served by a 5H and you guys just threw in a one inch because it was available in the back of the truck. And then you have one here because they desire it. I understand that. You can have a huge property with eight kids and a nanny and, and two rental units and a huge yard and a golf course you put up there and everything else and you want that extra capacity. You desire it. Ours isn't desires. Ours has been done from day one due to need as per your guys putting me in the one inch originally. Mm -hmm. It's a need. And how many other people are out there that have a need for it from three decades ago, okay, that, that are, are, can't even get the capacity of a five-eighths out of the one inch. How many of those people are out there? And I don't really think you're gonna find anyone that's in that situation. You know, and you basically have homes now that I'm the only one in my home, you got two people in the other home, one in the other home, we're using like two units of water. We've always been very conservative. You can look at our records. We've been there for over a decade. You can look at all of our things. We're being very conservative and we're paying $100 a month for two units of water. <laughs> That's never been the case. Yes, it's been a dollar or two more a month or three dollars more a month. And I actually did complain once um, when the meter jumped up to like eight or ten dollars more a month. I called and said, how come my meter's going up line? She said, oh, don't worry about it. We're going to be changing it over. You'll, you'll be the same price as the five eight. So your price, your average monthly cost will actually go down soon. I said, OK, good. Well, then I can deal with it for a few more months. And I paid the little extra, you know, the ten dollar extra or what it was. But it was always a little minimum amount. So it's like, why make a big deal out of it? Now it's over $600 a year, and I'm using two units a month. <laughs> I mean, this is insane. I was just pushing conservation, you know? So I really think that when I go through these cases, case-by-case case basis of these things, you know, we are an additional thing that was simply overlooked. That's all we're saying is you guys overlooked our unique case. And because you overlooked our unique case, you can add another one there. You can legitimately add one there for us. And it is, and, and so it, it is a unique special case. The second one was that it has to be in harmony with the general intent and purposes of the policy of the district. Your policy is to charge by capacity. We're not even getting the capacity of a 5 eighths. We're only getting two thirds the capacity of a 5 eighths. Okay. And then the last one is that it has to be a grant with special privilege, not in, in, uh, that has to be not inconsistent with those placed on other parcels. Well, if you have a one inch meter for people with a fire that was told that, oh yeah, well, you're gonna have to have a one inch meter here for your home to be able to be built or for your remodel to be able to be done. And they said, fine. And you're granting them a waiver and they're getting the full 50 gallons a minute every day to use as they wish for free. We're not even getting that. And we were before them. <laughs> we were before fire suppression units. So, I mean, if you're giving this special circumstance to them, you certainly should be giving it to us. So I don't understand. I mean, we meet all the three requirements that you guys are required to give us a variance. You, you made an attempt to do this. You just simply overlooked our special circumstance and we are unique. There are not gonna be any other people coming forward that can say that my meter isn't at the property line and I don't even get the capacity of a 5 eighths out of my one inch. If you just listed that as another exception here, there wouldn't be anybody else coming forward. It's just our three homes. We are a unique special circumstance. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Um, you mentioned these other homes that in the area that have private roads and, right. and there's a trunk running up them. Exactly. Would that satisfy you if we put one of those in? Yeah, if you want to want a water main up our road and then put the meter out our property line, that's fine. What would that cost them uh, to, to do that sort of thing? Um, I'm not sure what the cost is, but my understanding is where we've done that before in the previous examples that are listed, the developer pays for that, not the homeowners. So it's it's the but the developer's long the gone. developer and then passes that cost on. Mm -hmm. So, but it's not the district that pays for that. Not the district, no sir. So even when they were individual lots like a Lynette Lynette Court. 
Can so, I see some? Because I've never seen anything. Because that's always been a question we had, is how come ours is unique and everybody else? Because these are all individual lots. These weren't developments. As Lynette Court was all separate lots. Viewpoint was all separate lots. Sunset, all separate lots. And these are all right off of Mesa Drive. That's what the caption was. And every single one of those, it went right up to it. And I've never seen any reason why ours didn't. Is there any documentation on that? I'm sure there is. Yeah. Well, I know that I've been on the board for a long time, and we've often gotten, in some cases, single-family homes, and uh, they had to put in their own main and paid for it. So it does happen. Because right but now what we have is we have two-inch lines that run up to our properties underneath the road, which is pretty good size capacity. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and on my home in particular, when I had a shower running, and I turned on another shower, I had to guess one of the showers was shut off. So that gives you an idea of where we are on pressure. It would squeal and shut off. Mm -hmm. So when I redid my remodel, I actually took the two inch line and continued that all the way up to my house. Once it got into the house, I paid for two inch copper pipe all the way up as high as I could get and then switched over to one inch for the rest and, and up into the house. And now I can run two showers at once. I mean, we are right at the borderline. Where we're at. As I said, and it's been like this for a long time. Okay. And we're not getting the capacity. You're, you're charging us for capacity that we can't get. Okay. Thank you. Next. Uh, hi, I'll just reiterate. I also live on uh, Ventana Court and been working with Jack and also your group of engineers. I just uh, will just reiterate it is a unique situation. Uh, we aren't against going to the five A's. We understand that there is, uh, even though we have been told initially that, that it won't work given our current flow, it will drop drastically low. I am sort of against putting in uh, a pump because um, it's another environmental issue. You know, it's running more electricity, so it's adding noise, it's adding electricity. And right now we're in a situation where it works, and it's kind of like, okay, we're going to take it away from you and now push uh, this more environmentally friendly way of, of solving this problem. After 30 years. Um, Thank okay. you. Question for staff. Um, just so, you know, because we always have to look at what, you know, the great, they're not using much water, but if someone else bought the homes and moved there and they were using a one inch uh, meter still and they did put in a booster pump, what would the capacity then become? If they put in a booster pump, I'm assuming they could pull full capacity off of the meter. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and and mm -hmm. so uh, while Mr. Zahorsky and um, his neighbor feel that their situation is unique, when you look at the district's distribution system as a whole, it's not. We have a number of customers who have solved just this issue by putting in a booster pump. Right. And the district did not run the mains up there. Those were developer installed at their expense, why they chose not to run a main um, up to these three parcels, I don't know. But the district didn't do that. But, but, okay. Could Wait. We use a Sh you you can't, Excuse sorry. Me. Public comment. Can, can you please check to make sure the microphones are working for that? So I do want to confirm something that was stated earlier by, by Leslie that I know in my history here over 19 years there have been numerous occasions where developers pay to put in mains um, and one was mentioned that even for a single family home and, and in this case that I'm going to mention on Linda Vista Avenue in La Salva Beach the pressure is very low in that area and an at the applicant for one home extended the main several hundred feet and even put in a booster pump. Um, that's correct. That's correct. Um, another point that we've been working very for the several months with these applicants, and it's been cordial, um, more technical on my side, but what we've found is that the pressure loss in the smaller meters as compared to the one inch is really negligible. The difference is very negligible until you start flowing you know, more than 10 to 15 gallons per minute, and even at 20, then it diverges. Um, and so we've, we've tried to ask our customers here in front of you, you know, what do they really think they're going to be using on a daily basis, gallons per minute? And um, 
of the other customers that have downsized, they may not be in a similar situation as these two or three, um, but they have not yet reported to us any, you know, discontent or they're happy with the, the downsizing. So I would, I would strongly encourage uh, these folks to try a five eights and see if that works for them. I think there are, there's a, a couple more months left on the, on the trial period. And, um, you know, maybe it is that they're not using up to maybe 13, I think Mr. Zahorsky, that's what he said, about two thirds of the five eighths inch capacity, which is about 13 gallons a minute. I don't believe there'd be significant pressure loss be in, in the five eighths at that flow rate. So. Sorry, back and forth. you don't get to, you, you had your time to talk to us and you've done that and we don't get to grill the, the whoever else is. Okay. I know you're not allowed to do that. You had your, you had your piece and now you have to sit and listen. Okay. So I, th I think back in the eighties when, when these homes were built, you know, it was a cost benefit analysis of, well, is it cheaper to put in a one inch meter because they paid the connection fee for a one inch meter. We didn't give them a discount mm -hmm. back then. They, you actually paid at the time the additional cost for the higher, bigger meter. Um, and I presume that was much cheaper than extending a main up like the other roads, um, which could have been done and then a five eighths inch put in for each home. Mm -hmm. But Taj, you should refresh yourself on, the, on the, the graph that you shared with them. If the graph is wrong, it's wrong, but it does diverge at four for one eighth. And, okay. and, and I mean, for one inch and a five eighth. Okay, and at 10 GPM, what's the pressure drop? Uh, the pressure drop between a one inch and five. At, at 10 GPM, five say. Yeah. Five eighths is three. It's uh, about a three to three PSI. Yeah, which, you know, at, at well, yeah, to me, I. These are technical issues yeah. that, you know, have been worked on. I, so, full disclosure here, um, I've known Jack for over 20 years. I have not known, I've never met actually the other uh, okay. neighbors. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also, full disclosure, well, first of all, staff has done a wonderful job of, of um, working on this issue. And I've acted as a um, you know, to to try and understand the problem, I've talked with with Ron, and I've also talked with with Taj, and I think Leslie and I have talked as well. So, um, I am not going to recuse myself because um, my thinking is not being affected by knowing. Um, knowing Jack for that amount of time and the have no financial interest, interest yourself. or whatever yeah. so okay I'm not legally required I've been advised to recuse mm -hmm. myself it, that's correct the only thing I would add um, director Jaffe based on our conversation today you also have in any in none of your prior conversations ever indicated that you would decide this one way or another you have a, a complete open mind decision yet. thank you so. So we're still under uh, the public comment section of this. So is anyone else? No, you've already talked. Is anyone else wish? For three minutes, don't we? You went He's way over uh, three minutes. No, I don't think we did. Let him finish. Okay. Why don't you let him come up? All right, fine. I think it was two it's minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes. Let him finish. Sure, come on up. Sorry, there was just one other thing in the letter, and it's a technical one, but mm -hmm. the district does have three quarter inch valves, and it's uh, meters and our understanding is that those are at the same rate as the five eighths. They're charged not differently. And that was one of the questions in the letter as to why they're getting that, that um, benefit. And okay. And I can answer that if you'd like. The three quarter inch meters are older meters and they have the same um, flow capacity as the newer five eighths inch meter. They're also being phased out as part of our meter replacement program. Mm -hmm. So we knew that was happening when we did the rate study and they said, since you're moving those out, we'll just lump them in together. There weren't that many of them and their flow capacities are very similar to the newer five eighths inch meters. Okay. Thank you. Okay, anyone else wish to speak on this item? Colonel Terry Maxwell, 
whose experience in monitoring government performance and trying to get it to improve, in some cases succeeding, includes working with Ralph Nader and my youthful idealism. I wish I could say I'm a customer of the Soquel Creek Water District and my goodness is it good. It's excellent. It's well managed. It's efficient. And it's planned ahead and all of that. I know the whole history. I've talked to residents for 40, who've been here 45 years. I know the sordid, sad history of Mr. Kriege's management. I know how millions of dollars have been misspent, wasted, that belong to your customers and ratepayers. Speak on this. No, line? no, no. I'm, I'm speaking on every topic. The this big isn't picture. every topic. This is one particular topic. Yeah. Well, well, I'm offering my views. And don't interrupt me, please, and shorten my time. To the topic. This is a public hearing about this particular issue. This is this public comment hearing? No. No. A, a, you can have, you can comment this on this item, this comment. variance this request. This is one item. When will it's public comment be available? After Afterwards. This. Okay, item four. I'm, then I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to interrupt that. Um, I wish you'd be more simpatico to the customer here and the rate payer. I really think you ought to accommodate him, you and your staff. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else wish to spike, speak on this item? Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. I just want to point out to these gentlemen in the audience that this topic has been um, discussed and somewhat litigated by Mr. John Cole. And um, I urge all ratepayers to contact Mr. John Cole and look into that case because this is not the first time it's come before you. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Seeing no one, do I hear a motion to close the public hearing? I make the motion. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. So bring it back to the board. So any questions or comments or anything about this? I have some, but perhaps. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. So I looked into uh, the, in the board packet on page 33. It talks about variances and it, section 1.0 and where it says generate general variances may be granted to the ordinances and resolutions of the district such variances may be granted by the board of directors only when because of special circumstances applicable to the property in question including but not limited to size shape topography location or surroundings the strict application of the ordinance or resolution deprives such property of privilege, privileges enjoyed by other property in the district which are substantially similar. So to me it specifically talks about topography and in, this is a situation where the topography is causing the lower pressures and substantially similar they are not getting um, a high capacity of flow. So essentially what they're doing is they're paying for a capacity that they're not getting not a great analogy but it but not a bad analogy would be if somebody was being charged for more water than they were getting because their meter wasn't working properly we would all go oh they shouldn't be charged for that because they're not getting what we're, they're promised or what and it, this is the same situation they're they're not getting the capacity that we're charging them for so there's there's no physical way unless they put in a, a booster pump and Tom Tom um, noted that that somebody in the future could put in a, few, a booster pump and then they would be getting the capacity so I would certainly not grant a variance unless there are stipulations that they couldn't do such a thing um, which would be hard to monitor but it would be a stipulation. But the um, the other thing that's come up in the, the packet is the um, an attachment, I believe it's number six, the, wa the, um, the waiver, the waiver for pressure was, uh, that's page 36, and it underlined or insufficient water pressure but what isn't underlined is that um, that the 
releases the district from any claims of any kind whatsoever. I don't think there's a claim being 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 hit uh, being issued here, but um, because of that, because of inconvenience or in our in our policy on page eight talks about inconvenience or damage, damage from high water pressure, inconvenience for low water pressure. I don't see that as being the same, being, being the case here at all. <coughs> so I don't, I do see this as a unique situation and given that they're not able to, to get the flow, I don't think that, that we should be charging them for the flow. And I think it is, um, and other people in the district, I'd be open to this as well. And Leslie talks about it being opening up a can of worms. Um, I don't think so. I think that uh, it's a unique enough situation that it wouldn't open it up. And I'd, I'd actually think that you open up a can of worms by not um, treating customers fairly. And I think this is not a, a case where the customers are being treated fairly. Anyone else? I, I mean, I, I have that, my main issue is being fair, not just to these folks, but to the other folks that have had to deal with similar situations. So um, and that's why I'm always reluctant to you know, go along with a special circumstance unless it truly is different than what a lot of people have already dealt with. And from what I understand from staff is there are a lot of people that have been in a similar situation of put in booster pumps and dealt with it. And so I'm still having trouble with, you know, I, I understand what you're saying, Bruce, but I still, I want to be fair to the other people who have had to go along with, you know, the way the rules are. Well, I, I, Tom, so have there been one inch meters with where people want to have greater capacity where they put in booster pumps? <coughs> so, so. Can, I don't think we can answer I don't know. that. There's been other meter, other meter sizes other than just the one inch? Just a mobile. And they, they, were, they were trying to get up to 50 gallons per yeah. minute? We've had a number of people who have put in booster pumps because the flow, we've met the flow requirements at the meter but the flow capacity at their house isn't sufficient. So they've put in a booster pump. Whether they're one inch meters customers or not, I don't know. Yeah. But I know we have various sizes. We've got five eighths inch customers that have done that. We've got larger meters that have done that. They would get a benefit from putting in the booster pump. Right. There they would not be a benefit to these customers because they don't use the amount of water that the capacity I, I think I think what she's trying to say I mean maybe this will help with clarification those people probably would have rather had a larger meter instead of putting in a booster pump if they would could get the low the larger meter at a lower cost but because we the the rate study and whatnot is based on capacity at the meter that's not allowable by the way we operate now. And I do want to correct one thing that Leslie said that I want to take this opportunity, I think it's important, is that the five eighths don't produce exactly the same amount as the three quarter. I want to acknowledge that you brought that up, the old three quarter. They're closer, the three quarters closer to the three, the five eighths than probably the, the new three quarters, but those are being phased out also. So I did want to honor you on that because I think you, you stated it two ways. They were the same and then approximately, so I want to make that clarification for the record. But to be clear, um, there are customers in the, in the situation where they would like more flow. We provide it at the meter, but because their house is a long ways away, they've either they put in a booster pump or they're paying for a larger meter size. We definitely have customers in that, in that situation. And it, to me, it, it seems like right now, the, since there's a question about whether a 5 8 inch meter, a current newer 5 8 inch meter might actually provide adequate flow based on our engineering manager's thoughts, it seems like a simple thing to try. First. You don't lose anything, I don't think, by trying. 5 8 Sonic? Or? You can't ask questions. I, I, I just close the whatever the. I'm, I'm going along with what you know somebody in engineering would know better than I that yeah. there's it's worth a try 
to see if that would meet the flow needs. And we might be back here in sure. a couple yeah, months. Could be, but. But the, the 5 eighths inch restricted, I mean, we do restrict, I don't see a difference between a 5 eighths inch restricted charging less money for that because the capacity is lower and charging less for a, a um, one inch that can't provide the capacity. Is it different? Maybe I'm missing something. Because if somebody put in a booster pump, they're not, they may not always live there. We have to look f for the whole life of a property. So, I mean, somebody would come in and say, Yahoo, I got a one inch meter and I'm putting in a booster pump. Because, I mean, I have a booster pump on some property we have and it's not an uncommon thing for people to do that. So we have to look at the overall water use. We, w we would know though, Tom, because we're, we got AMI, we're gonna be, no, no. Yeah, you tell you you could tell what the what the but not gonna, for a short period gonna, of time, but for anyway. you know, yeah. Okay. Well, I think if we were to look all over the district, we'd find all kinds of different flow amounts. I mean, depending on what their elevation is, where the nearest pump is, where the nearest tank is, and whether they're on or not on, and so if we did what was suggested, I mean, we'd basically have to go around to every every meter in the in the district and see how much flow each one has and have a separate price for that one meter and that's just getting ridiculous that would be ridiculous i agree with that i'd like to mention one other thing in addition to this uh you know separate t um, pump or whatever another thing to do which i have experience with i used to live up in the mountains on montebello road uh, in cupertino and we had our own private well because we were like two thousand feet above the valley and uh, we had our, because of the private well, you don't want the well to turn on every time you get a glass of water to drink. Mm -hmm. So they have this big tank with a, with a spring in it. And every time it get, the tank gets low and the pressure gets low, the well pump goes on, it goes fill, 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 and the pressure builds up and it shuts off. And then if you get your drink of water, it comes down a little bit and a little bit. And so it means that the pump only turns on very irregularly but you get full flow into the house from just that so it, it's not electrical it's a, you know just a, a tank with a spring in it basically and you put it above the house and no, so no, that you I put it it was in, in the backyard right right at, you know you where need, the you need pressure well you get it from the from the from the from well spring. pump the well oh, and then the spring keeps it going until it needs to current turn on again so when the pressure goes down a ways then the well pump comes back on fills it up the pressure builds up and then you live off of that for a while and then indeed if you're yeah there, there could be a so it, it, it's nice because you don't need electricity you don't have to run electricity lying down you can actually put it up by the residence and it means that you can do that so it might be cheaper and easier than you know, what was been suggested by staff but so you know trying a five eighths inch could be a reasonable solution yeah or it might not right but if somebody's using two units and they're paying a hundred dollars a month for that, to me that's which is what it would be now. It it doesn't seem like that's fair. But it could be a five eight centimeter with some other solution, whether it does it without a any kind of pump or tank or or not. So I I mean I still feel like we need to be consistent with all of our customers. So well, if there's no more discussion, does anyone want to make a motion? I'm going to make a motion that we deny the variance. I would second that. Um, request the board consider if you uh, denying the variance um, without prejudice to reapplication because there was some discussion if the 5 eighths doesn't work about potentially reconsidering the issue in the future. Um, and your policy prohibits someone from reapplying for a year unless the board um, makes the motion to that effect. Sure. That's fine with me. To add to the motion that they could reapply if other solutions don't work? Yes, that please. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's fine. It gives them a, an option to try and find a solution. Okay. And then come back. Okay. So we have a motion and a second. Do we need to do roll call? I guess not. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed. I don't think there's a variance here. All right. Okay. So that's that item. So we move on to the consent agenda. Does the board have any things they want to pull from the consent? I'd like to pull production. 
production, right? That's uh, 3.4. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. Anyone in the public wish to pull any items? Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. I'd like to pull item 3.3, .3, please. 3.3. .3. Anything else? Seeing none. I'll move approval of the remaining I'll second. consent agenda items. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That's unanimous. So we go to 3.3. Three. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. Thank you for allowing me to pull this item off the con sent agenda for better discussion. I would like explanation of the um, uh, Capital Edge fund that is uh, $17,500. That's your lobbyist in Washington, D.C. Can you please explain for me and your ratepayers what that money bought? Uh, that's on page 53. And also um, on page 51, the $7,000 paid to Black and Veatch for consulting for the city is what I read in there. And that's, I believe, related to the water transfers. But I would like to understand what the $7,000 bought. And then uh, also please explain the $137,270 um, expenditure to Best Best and Krieger. Um, I, I'm very well aware of that litigation, but what exactly did that cover and provide for your right rate payers? Thank you. Can I answer the one about Capital Edge? Um, so I questioned the whole idea of having somebody in Washington helping us keep track of the opportunities for funding. I mean, that's the main reason, uh, is to so that we have an opportunity for funding up for funding of our pro projects that would save our ratepayers money, and and turns out that we did get a forty-nine million dollar low interest loan from the federal EPA through our efforts to go to Washington and talk to them several times, and and so to me, you know, the money was well spent. Um, that's all. Another thing to add to that is that the. Bureau of Reclamation, which we also lobbied in Washington, D.C., has yet to respond to our request for uh, uh, some kind of a... I think it's highly likely we'll get some loans there. Yeah, or, or grants. Uh, yeah. yeah. So I think it's it's been more than worth it's, it's what we spent. Yeah. Yeah, I I'm was against that, too. Mm -hmm. But it's proven to be to save money for our customers. Yeah. I think we thought that the, uh, the federal... Uh, loan is going to save us something like 11 million dollars for our rate yeah, approximately 11 million due to the lower interest rate the savings in the 40 mi 49 million dollar right. low interest loan equate to about 11 million dollars in and grant or free money i guess so that's way cost. way way over what we spent it's a good investment very very uh, thousands of times yeah. yep. tens of thousands of times and then let me ask staff this consulting for city of mm -hmm. SC water transfer. It's not the city. Of it's SC. not paying the city. On, uh, water it, transfer. It's yeah. It should be <laughs> for water transfer or on water transfer. Is that correct? Yeah. Taz will address <laughs> that. We're, you know, we're cooperating. Fact, you know. We'll be invoicing the city for half of that invoice. That's okay, what so they we've been it, sharing that. It benefits us. That's right. Yeah. Okay. City and us. We're it's part of the agreement we have with the city to. That's correct. To do this transfer experiment and uh, to split the costs for that. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's that. Production reports? Uh, yeah. The next one is 3.4 production. Reports. I just, was there anything else? No. Nope. No. I just love these. <laughs> I just, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, because it, to me, it's a pulse of the district. Yeah. And it, it shows, like this one up. You can see how our our usage has decreased since before after the drought. It's hard to tell what all those colors are, but um, and it also shows that the the decrease has been pretty much summertime mainly, but it also has 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 been in other months as well, 
and then I I saw you know like there's in December the the orange you know st sticks out above the others and I then went to the graph on page the weather index yeah the index I guess there, that's there you go yeah you've got it there quicker than I do and it, that particular year it just was warm so a lot of a lot of explanations for how our 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 customers are responding mm -hmm. and how our, our water production responds to the to the weather but this one i you know the green on this is the production and the and the the red the kind of the reddish color purplish red color is um the one with the squares is the weather index and you see the weather index changes throughout the year but it and it changes from year to year a bit too but the green has been dropping and dropping and dropping and that is a testament to our customers who have, are conserving water yeah. so another important factor is if you look at page 80 this is the annual and this past year for the first time in a long time we've actually gone down you know, since yeah. 2000 15 we've been going up 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 right. so that was the rebound we've been talking yeah. about and this year for some of these of other effects uh, it's gone down a little bit i mean i think with december's production some of that lower in the perissima is because of our water transfers right when you look right. when you look yeah from <laughs> one yeah right. but then if you go a little higher on this you can see just one no same same image you can see back in 2005 through 2007 it was mm -hmm. more than 50 percent more water usage than there is today. Yeah. so yep. i just love these figures mm -hmm. i just like talking about them <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think the other interesting thing for me to point out because it's all about preventing seawater intrusion when we had these water levels right around in here the some of the protective water levels were met but when it was in this range uh, they started dropping again, so it, it it started going negative. Water level, protective water levels went positive. When use went down to here, we dropped from about several from wells being not protected, and then even around in here in this low usage, uh, additional wells dropped below protective water levels. So this is this was kind of the crux point. In any case, that's not enough to restore things. No, it's, it's not. It's not. It started getting worse right right in here. Uh, another well dropped. So right. it responds to m m many years of rainfall, not just. Yeah, and then, and then, but well, what I'm saying is, even though water levels were yeah. low here, protective water levels became worse right in this area. Gotcha. One one more well yeah. became. We have to do more. We'll yeah. do more. Yeah. yeah, it's a hard thing to explain because there's up and down, but right. yeah, there's a lot of factors, but you can tease them out. But this is you, you, what you point out here is absolutely amazing because this red and green are tracking one for one this disparity is our customers reducing water outdoors yep. plain and simple hot weather and not watering as much and they they've even reduced it during the during the winter time as well after the summer but much more outdoors much more much yeah. much more yeah all right so if that's enough we'll move on so this is the time for oral and written communications so anyone can address President Daniels, I apologize. Um, before we move on, could we get a motion to approve the warrants at, uh, at least? All right. Because um, 3.3 well, 3 had been pulled. That. That's good. good. I'll make the motion. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for watching out for us, Josh. <laughs> the team. Yeah. Yeah. You've earned your money for the night. <laughs> Colonel Terry Maxwell again. Again, I wish I could just have nothing but praise for the Soquel Creek Water District, but I can't. I can't for the 40-year history that I've read, talked to customers that long. I can't for my own observations. Now, I realize we've got an issue of water in California. We've got a water in this district. But you have permitted the Aptos Village to proceed. You have permitted a 17-unit hotel to proceed without adequate offsets, without adequate. You have let Swenson get away with fraud in terms of his reductions at Cabrillo College. Ms. Steinbrenner has made that clear. Those are all instances of poor mismanagement by this board and some of its senior management. 
I applaud the work I have observed of many of your employees. They're competent, they're conscientious, and they really do take seriously producing and delivering water to your customers here. I cannot say that about my observations of your senior management. I can't say that sadly about my observations of your directors. What I can say is you've also abused Ms. Steinbrenner through your attorney, Mr. Basso. I watched judges in this superior court of this county and I've talked to people who've practiced law here for 35 years and they tell me, yes, we have some judges that are abysmal. We have conflicts of interest, we have accommodations to Mr. Basso because he helped him become judges. In the case of Judge Gallagher, he formally represented you guys for 19 or 23 years. He had a horrible conflict of interest, plus Mr. Basso had been his law partner. I watched Judge Gallagher ignore the evidence Ms. Steinbrenner presented as a concerned public citizen that you had not complied with the California Environmental Quality Act and related statutory and case law. I watched the evidence presented by Mr. McGilvey and Mr. Jerry Paul and elsewhere that Ms. Steinbrenner introduced. You ignored, uh, rather, Judge Gallagher ignored the evidence. He ignored the law. I've seen it happen in this county. And I'm not alone in saying I've seen it happen. I watched Gallagher do it a second time. I watched Judge Schmall do it a second time, and he welcomed Mr. Bossa to his courtroom. And then he mistreats Ms. Steinbrenner with trying to get a sanction on her. Your agent did that. And as a result, I presented a written public statement that I'll, in, into your record. Clean up your act. Be ethical. Be considerate. And on the pure water SoCal, it should be properly called, as many say, the poop water SoCal. You have not considered the alternatives presented. Had you presented, considered the alternatives presented by Mr. McGilvoy and Jerry Paul, your project couldn't go through. And your $59 million grant is arguably theft from the federal taxpayers. Thank you. Next. Good morning. Good evening. Becky Steinbrunner, resident of Aptos. I'd like to give um, your clerk here a copy, uh, one for each of you, a copy of an email that I received last Friday. Well, that was sent to me last Friday by Ms. Olin. I didn't receive it until today. And then also just one copy that I would like, um, I, I submitted in response to her email just late before coming here, but I want to enter it into the record. There's only one copy of my response, but a copy of her communication for each of you. The issue uh, regarding this is that um, I have for over a year been obtaining a hard copy in advance of your board agenda packets so that I could read the material and research things that were of concern to me and I didn't have to ask unnecessary questions. I was publicly um, criticized by Director LeHue when I didn't do that and was ordered to come prepared and to have read the agenda packets if I was going to participate. That's what caused me to begin asking um, Ms. Olin for a hard copy and it was provided free of charge. Today, I was really disappointed to go to the office to get the, uh, the ad agenda packet in advance and was told I could no longer have that. I tried to uh, talk with Mr. Duncan about it and he refused to come out. This is a new policy. If I, and, and in reading the email, if, if I want to get a hard copy, I have to pay for it. This is new policy. It seems like um, it was never discussed publicly with your board. It seems like it's a form of um, censorship in keeping information away from people who have difficulty, like myself, reading vast amounts of material <laughs> on a screen. And um, I cannot afford to pay for this information. You have one copy in the back, but I can't take it with me, I have to sit way in the back and I have difficulty hearing you from the back. And thank you for putting the microphones on now. 
So I want to bring that to your attention. And I ask that you discuss it on an agenda item next time. I also want to point out to you that um, on January 1st, I received an email blast from Mr. Duncan, and it included a lot of information, and included in that was personal information of some people who had, uh, one person who had emailed Rosemary Menard about the water transfer issues. That email was transferred or copied to Taj Dufour, and Mr. Duncan included it in this email blast on New Year's Day that included Mr. Robert Lay's Thank personal you. telephone number. Thank you. Thank you. Time's up. That's serious. You need to think about this. Anyone else? Thank you so much. Lowell Webb, I'll be rather brief. I've watched this monkey business going on for quite a while with your poop water soquel, and it doesn't appear that you've paid any attention to the other alternatives. I've never seen any record of what you've done of it and what you've done with it. You've got a whole lot of money standing here. You've spent a whole lot of money already. You can get by without wasting the rest of it by taking a hard look at the other alternatives. And I think you need to pay a lot more attention to Ms. Steinbrenner. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Seeing no one, I, comment, Ron? I, I do want to comment about uh, written communications when you're done here. Okay. If you're just so seeing no one else, I'll close the public input. Um, any directors want to say anything? Um, just. I mean, I just, it's hard for me to hear somebody say that we didn't look at alternatives. I'm not sure where they were five years ago when we went through this whole process, but um, yes. it was a long public process. That's all. Well, I want, I want to talk a bit more about that. Uh, if you look at chapter seven of our EIR, the very first page of it, quotes from the statute that sets up the EIR process, and it says that an alternative has to be something you have some control over. And both of the alternatives that have been mentioned, this Lockwaffer thing of Jerry Paul's, as was mentioned, he's talking about giving us water from the Loch Lomond that is owned and run by the city. They have water rights to it. We don't have any rights to it at all. Therefore, it cannot be an alternative of, of, for us unless the city were to offer it. And the city has never done that. And, and as, as well, um, the stuff that McGivery does has been mentioned. He talks about how much water the city has available in their water rights. But again, the city won't give us any of that water. I mean, they've offered 300 acre feet a year for this exploration that we're doing together. But otherwise, they haven't offered us any additional water. And so that's not water we can claim as an alternative because we have no control, no access to it. And so it's, these are not alternatives. They never have been. Whether they ever will be, I don't know. I know that some of these people have appeared before the city's water commission as well as the city council. And I know that they also appeared during the WASAC process. And for some reason, the city has never decided, nor, nor did WASAC ever decided to even take up these as alternatives. So the city doesn't consider them alternatives unless the city offers them to us. They're not our alternatives. So. You can complain all you want, but, but those are not alternatives. The law changed so in September. The failed to apply for new water rights. Me. Quiet. You failed. You're out of order. Quiet. You're out of order. So if we're going to, in the vein of written communication, I'd like to share something. Uh, back in October 15th, I believe, the board received a letter from some customers um, that attended uh, an event where they were uh, information was uh, spread and they they sent this email here basically saying help explain our rates what about these other alternatives by uh, scott mcgilvery can you explain those and so in the bottom of the letter it says you know that i offered to meet with them i attended that event and said i'd be glad to explain uh, you know more about the uh, data the information factual based and so they said no in the letter, and then they ended up taking me up on it. And if you could go to this correspondence of 
this agenda item. Uh, it's, a, it's a situation, I show this because here are some people who had serious questions and they wanted to know about different options. They wanted to know about the rates and they did, yeah, go to 2009, yeah, go to there. Is it in this one? Yeah, it's 20. And, and so they did meet with myself and Courtney, a uh, uh, water uh, customer service person up front does billing. We sat down, I think, for at least an hour and went through the information. We walked them through the community water plan, the different options, and they really listened. And, and you can see I call them the champions here. Here's their, their email back to, uh, to us or to me. The board's copied. Uh, you know, they're heroes in my mind because so quickly we're, people are making decisions without the, the correct information or hear something and, and run off with it. These people didn't do that. They took the time. We took the time. They listened. We, I listened to them. We listened to them. And then we actually sent Roy Sykes. Roy Sykes went out there to follow up, not just to listen, but to act. And so the, the last email up here basically says, thank you for taking time. Roy is helping us save even more water, and these people have reduced their water significantly. They're, and uh, so they're just an example when communication can be properly done and people do take time. Uh, I think this is, can be the result. So I just wanted to show that. It's an example of where we're trying to go when people do have these type of uh, questions about the water supply options and their rates. We're trying to take time with them one on one to help them get their bill down. Thank you for doing that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So is there any other director? I just have a question about agendas being available in paper copy. So are those not available? What's well, the difference between agenda and the board packet, of course? Or the board packet, I mean. So we can address that over here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is the uh, <coughs> board packet, we charge a per page fee just like we would for any um, other, uh, other public record. Um, it was one of the things that um, I spoke with about Ron when I, when I kind of came on board. Um, what I'd say in my experience, it's it's pretty standard um, to charge a, a a fee for for getting a copy of the packet, just given all the copying charges that the district's incurring to to provide those. And the other alternative um, ways to access the agenda without charge, um, and so you know that would include you know, your website as well as the uh, complimentary copies that you provide it at the meeting itself. But we could. Uh, if the board would like, you can provide complimentary copies to members of the public of the entire pack would, agenda packet. I mean, there's not that many people that want the whole packet. But if somebody's having trouble accessing it via computer, I still think we ought to have it available. Okay. I mean, I don't know how the you guys feel, but I mean, for the cost of paper, if somebody really wants to take the time to read it, mm -hmm. and they can't, they're having trouble with whatever computer access, then... I, I don't think that's much of a cost for us to make that available. I don't know. Minor. Yeah. So so why don't bring we bring that back? Yeah, yeah, yeah let's bring so it back. Yeah. I, I'll, yeah. I'll make a request so we bring that Absolutely. back. Yeah. Okay. Bring it back. So a certain number of copies, whatever, you know, just because, you know, Miss Steinbrenner might not be the only one. Okay. You know. Okay. 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 Uh, so we move on to the management update. 5.1. I'll kick that off for conservation customer service field. I just wanted to um, point out um, the AMI projects moving along. We're almost halfway done with the uh, register upgrades, metering upgrades, and uh, a little bit over halfway done with installing all of the infrastructure that's needed to pick up the reeds. And we're seeing some really pretty amazing and exciting results, as I pointed out here in number five. Um, we did find one commercial property that was vacant and got a leak alert on that and got out there right away, um, avoiding that water loss for the three weeks that we would have normally seen it go on for with our, our current metering system. Um, that saved about a quarter of an acre foot of water, so in one case alone. So it's really exciting. We're um, working on our processes and continuing to refine how we respond to leaks and uh, just tracking those and, and starting to build up kind of our database of, of water savings. So very exciting. Yeah, I'll just add, because uh, I'm so excited about it, that quarter acre foot, that water savings is equal to about what a household would use in a full year. 
So, and that just that one leak detection. So, thank yeah. you, Shelley, you and your team. Some house, two households for some house. Some, yeah, two for <laughs> some. That's correct. Depends. Yeah. There's one thing in the report that I am worried about, which is the statement with these fixed network, this is B2, with these fixed network uh, equipment installation, staff is expecting to be able to read most of the mutas. Mm -hmm. And that concerns me if we're not, it's like saying we'll be able to deliver water to most of our customers. And I don't sure. like the most. I, I want it to be all. I don't see why it shouldn't be all. It's not a perfect technology, meaning there may be days when a read doesn't come in and it might come in, you know, a couple days later. And then those reads are averaged over that time period. There could be uh, cars parked over meters uh -huh. um, and that prevents a signal from coming in. There's you know unexplained things that could happen but we're shooting for an overall performance of about 98 percent and that's what our contract guarantees that's pretty standard with with ami equipment um, we may have to put in some additional repeaters to help with the signal in some areas so we're continually working to make it better and to be able to pick up as much as we possibly can so we can't do anything about parked cars, but if if our network is insufficient, we should fix it requires that. more repeaters. Right. We can't do something yeah. about that. Yeah, because a couple of percent is you know, like 300 customers not being able to get this, and I think that's that's mm -hmm. too much. Mm -hmm. We should strive for something better than that. Okay. And I did I did like that you're talking with others about the software, to yeah to to get you know get uh, the information out to our customers when they do have a an issue and also I think a lot of our customers if the software is sophisticated enough would use that to to you know to lower their water use oh, yeah mm -hmm. yeah so I've talked with people who you know if, if there was software that showed you know minute by minute they would get into at that level of detail mm -hmm. well if there's nothing else on this section let's go to engineering Mr. Taj. Hello again. I'm going to cover both engineering and O&M for uh, Christine Mead. Um, but so for our uh, department, we I want to update you. There's actually in ours as well as hers, there's some news that came about after this was published. Uh, for the Granite Way well, we had hoped that on Friday PG&E would do their part. And for the second time, they let us down. Uh, that has been rescheduled for February, and so it sits kind of waiting for them to do their work. And this is unfortunate, and we voiced our discontent, um, but that well, our, our goal of getting it online is probably pushed by several weeks now. Um, for the surface, water purchase with the city of Santa Cruz um, my report as well as Christine's indicated that you know it was opened uh, as of December 6th and um, on January 10th the city asked us to uh, reduce the flow uh, down to 250 gallons a minute um, based on trying to balance their production needs um, since then, on Friday afternoon, um, they called us and said they had to, we had to shut it off completely due to a main break on their north coast uh, line. Mm -hmm. And they expect it to be out for at least two weeks. Um, well, they anticipate that source. It's one of their sources. It's for the, um, the major's uh, line is now not available and they expect that to be out of out of service for at least a year um, but they advised us that we needed to turn off the inner tie for at least two weeks um, the fish uh, migration has has changed um, two weeks ago it was because of migration flows and now um, spawning restrictions are in place so they're basically not taking water from the one north coast source uh, which is Lydell so that's the update for the surface water uh, situation. I had a question about that. Yeah. Uh, just the percentages that were in the O&M report. Um, it says the wells are um, 
Like there was um, two different things I Making didn't quite up the understand. Difference. This action required the district to turn off for turn on for short periods during times of high demand, producing approximately seven percent of the water supply. And then in the next bullet point, the wells are now producing approximately sixty percent of the water supply. Can you explain explain what percentages you're talking about? What water supply? Like the part that we're for the sub area. Sub area. Okay. Yeah. Sub Who's area. That? Sub area one. Okay. One just, into two. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Just wanted to make sure I was clear that that's what you're talking about. Okay. Um, we are also as for for Christine's O and M report. Our crew is getting ready to do some warranty work on the Cornwell tank um, in the next month or so, and so they've taken necessary action to get it ready to be drained. Um, so we'll be doing that. And I don't have anything else unless you have questions. Have we had any news about the ammonia investigation that you contracted? We expect uh, Corona Environmental to be updating us in the next week. Okay. Yeah, they're, they're reviewing week, all of our past yeah. data mm -hmm. and, and water quality. Good, okay. Yeah, so they're doing an alternatives assessment and we'll probably the next meeting or in, Feb in February, maybe the second meeting in February. Okay. Okay. So we're Thanks, going Josh. To Welcome. Yeah, thank you for covering Christine. Mm -hmm. Yes. Special projects. Yeah, I, um, I'm here if you guys have any questions. Um, I think it's really awesome that both you and Beck are involved in the water reuse um, association. So good job on that and on so many things. Um, I personally just had a question about the public outreach committee meeting and just wanted to see um, I, I don't my flight doesn't get in that day to 11 so I, I sent off an email saying I could be there you could be there okay great I didn't hear that came in, just came in. okay so we'll, we'll, he'll substitute for you that's fine okay. unless your flight gets in early you can let me well. know no, it would only be if the meeting was later in the day I could yeah. go, but not I'm not at 1030. Now. And and let me just clarify, Emma, did we reschedule the public outreach meeting? Because I know we did another meeting. Uh, that was, was the finance. finance. Okay. All right. Thank you. So this one will be February 11th. 1030. 1030. Hey, thank you, Bruce. All right. Thank you. Finance report. And I'm happy to answer any additional questions you might have as well. Um, we are sending W-2s out. Um, we should be able to make a decision on a financial advisor, hopefully by the end of the month here. And then the Finance and Administrative Services Committee meeting has been moved one week in the future. So. Thank you. You're welcome. Human Resources? I don't have anything to add unless there's any questions. Um, general manager yeah you know you got to be super stoked when your HR manager comes to you and goes have you seen the uh, new released water resiliency plan by the, the state and the governor that was recently released Tracy had looked at it she goes it's amazing we're doing almost everything that they asked for in there and, and, and it should that should be shared I mean that's what you said at the point of the, our meetings I was like okay let me let me look at it and so I did and when you read it I mean the the, the heart of what they're putting forth is um, recommended actions for the state of California to deal with more extreme droughts and flooding <laughs> rising temperatures and declining fish populations and aging infrastructure of course most of the Central Valley doesn't have to deal with seawater intrusion like we do but we are dealing with these other issues in addition to that so our plate is full uh, and as I say, we're in alignment with a, a lot of that. Uh, they also are, you know, always uh, on the hammering water conservation, which we uh, lead the effort, I think, in the state, along with Santa Cruz on that, and uh, pounding the drum on diversifying water, uh, your water supply, which we're doing with recycle water, and, uh, and they're recommending that for adaptation to climate change. So it's nice to see what this what this agency do, is doing is basically 
the blueprint for what they're recommending where you can. So I think we're, we're in good shape there. The Mid-County Groundwater Agency Sustainability Plan is being submitted as we talk each day. It's being uploaded. So thank you to all the directors who helped with that. Uh, appreciate that. And then, you know, I was really, you know, climate change, if you look way back, I'm a geologist, and geologists by nature don't move fast on positioning, so to speak, you know, formulating. It's like taking the data, taking the data. And I would, Dr. Jaffe, would you agree with that? I mean, we're, we're we, we, you know. Perspective. Yeah, you got, you got to have data. But I wish, but, you know, I've been watching the climate change stuff uh, for a long time now, and, and uh, I'm certainly a believer, but I was struck at a Santa Cruz meeting, Water Commission meeting, where Dr. Jaffe got up and spoke and said it was one of the things that really scares him. I think you used the word scare, and, um, and it's why you're doing what you do. Well, I'm, I would say I'm in the same boat now. I mean, when I opened the recent CalPERS thing, they have focused their uh, strategy, uh, investment strategy, around climate change. And so if that doesn't tell you something, probably the largest investor, I would probably say, in the United States. Um, and their strategy is, is taking that to heart. Uh, there was also an article published in the Sentinel, and it was called uh, Fever Chart, Earth Had Its Hottest Decade on Record in 2010. And this is by the uh, director of NASA, the Goddard Institute of Space Studies, pretty much a powerhouse. And he's, his quote is there at the bottom. If you think you've heard the story before, you haven't seen anything yet. So, again, I think we're on the right track by trying to diversify and get a resilient drought-proof supply, and I, I, I feel good about that. Just a quick question. Have other uh, groundwater sustainability plans been submitted yet that you know of? I don't know. We're, 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 I wouldn't say racing, but very proud if we're, if we're the first to upload. Yeah. But more importantly, we do it right. We're certainly going to make it. And I think um, we took uh, a lot of effort. I know Dr. Daniels was part of it on a, a committee to make sure all the people and agencies that had concerns were, uh, there were well thought out responses provided to them. So uh, otherwise, we could have loaded that puppy up pretty quickly. Matter of fact, we're helping inform DWR, I think, where some of their uh, issues are because we are the first investigating things. So Georgina and Cameron are saying, hey, look, this doesn't make sense. We're trying to upload, so they're correcting their site. Okay. So it's a little teamwork there. It might be the first then. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of climate change, one of the things that scares me, and I haven't reported that here before, but there's a, a science paper that talks about how analysis has changed. There's this issue that's always part of this, which is if you double CO2, what is the change in temperature? That's a it's kind of a fixed number. And of course, just like sea level rise, the more you analyze things, you can find, well, it wasn't quite right. In fact, you know, the original assumptions about sea level rise assumed that the glaciers were like blocks of ice. They would just sit there and slowly melt. And of course, what we're finding is, in addition to the melting, there's slope slitting down the slope and falling into the water and then melting much faster. And so that, that starts. But anyway, for the doubling, like 10 years, 10, 12 years ago, the number was 3.4 degrees centigrade. So if you double CO2, the increase of temperature would be 3.4 degrees. I think it was 3.4. And then like five years ago, the number had gone up to five, four point something degrees. And it's now like 5.3 degrees. So that's not, not even taking in the fact that CO2 is going up fast and faster, but just the effect of its doubling, the, the understanding now is that the impact is going to be that much greater. So it's, it's, which makes it even harder to achieve what they're looking for, which is, you know, to stop that increase because, you know, the system itself is showing that it's e increasing faster. So spooky stuff. Okay, so I think we're done with that. Uh, we have oral communication on management update. Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. 
I am happy that that huge leak <laughs> got caught early. Good work. Um, I have some questions about the um, operations and engineering report. I, I did note, um, because I, I go by it every day, that at the Granite Way well, there's an antenna put up, and I, I'm wondering if that, how, what's, what is the purpose of that antenna, and um, when will that be operational? I've never received any response from staff or the board regarding my communication um, <laughs> and the aesthetics of the Granite Way, well, <laughs> jail. <laughs> I'm going to call it a jail. Looks like a jail. And the pictures that were put up, you, you see what it looks like. That is not what the people were told that would look like back in 2015 when the project plans changed and the well was put over there on the corner. That was not at all what we were told. I really would like something different there. A lot of people would like something different there. I understand you need the security, but um, it's, it's quite offensive aesthetically. and. At least I would like a response to my message to your board and staff regarding that. I'm wondering um, when you might begin uh, updating your urban water management plan, which is due to be updated this year, and I'm eagerly looking forward to that, and I know that you will work hard and diligently on it. I attended a, um, a, in Paso Robles on January 8th a Sigma workshop put on by the Department of Water Resources, and um, it was excellent. I didn't see anybody there I knew from here, but I really was glad to go. And what I want you to know is that the, the laws have changed for water rights. Temporary water rights can now be applied for, and this district meets all of the requirements under Water Law 1425 to do so. And you were given that information in 2016, I believe, from Best Best and Krieger, a, a legal review of your water rights. So I would like to request that you ask staff to um, investigate that. What would be the possibility? Temporary water rights now have been expanded to five years worth of of ability to take water. And the fees have been reduced. The process has been streamlined. And the way that you calculate whether how much water there is has also been changed to be averaged out over a 30-year period. So I ask you to look into this to help augment your water policy. Thank, Thank you. you. Anyone else? Actually, I'd like to respond. Um, but then go ahead. Go ahead. So, in terms of aesthetics, there's probably everyone has a different idea of what's beautiful, but there's probably some similarities. But I'd like to request that we do uh, agendize at a future meeting, just to, you know if there's any any um, eyesores with our with our um, facilities and uh, we can we can discuss that at that point the granite way well one well, more than that if there's any you know anything else that that might uh, I mean we want to be good neighbors and absolutely so okay beyond granite way well okay Thank you very much. Colonel Maxwell I endorse Miss Steinbrenner's apt and erudite comments again and I agree you failed to look at your temporary water options and five years would let you maybe delay and suspend the unnecessary poop pure water Soquel project for another five years or 60 months at least. Um, I'm disappointed you haven't looked into the water alternatives she's made reference to. I'm disappointed you haven't implemented Bess Krieger's memoranda apparently that you paid an arm and a leg of your ratepayers money for. So please look into that. Otherwise, your failure to do so would be another act of negligence and mismanagement. I'll just say we follow all that. People who go to a meeting and, and think they learn something, and that's great. But this is what we do for a living. We're, we we stay on top of that. And, of course, there is the issue that if we were to apply for the water right, um, 
I mean, the, the river is pretty much fully allocated. We could apply for a water right on Soquel, and we have talked about that. That was a project back, you know, 10 years ago or something. Or more. Yeah, or more. And we could apply for that, um, and that's a possibility. But of course, to do any application, you need first to do an EIR. The city is currently doing an EIR for their uh, application, and we'd probably get sued by somebody uh, who doesn't like EIRs, and that, that would cost us, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars yet again. So I'm not a fan of that. So, all right, uh, let's go on to 5.2, District Council. Thanks. I want to just give a uh, um, update from our discussion at the last uh, meeting where the board had asked that I kind of look into um, your ability to regulate um, slanderous and abusive comments um, during public comment. Um, and so the the general rule is that just because a public comment is slanderous or abusive or incorrect um, or even profane uh, does not mean that we can um, prohibit it. Uh, there's actually been pretty substantial case law looking into this. And what the case law has said is that a public commenter needs to be disruptive, essentially, um, for, for them to sort of cross the line. And if they do cross that line, um, we can ask the commenter to leave the room. And in, wor and in absolute worst cases, we can actually require everyone to leave the room, um, with the exception of media that's not participating in the disruption. Um, did want to note, though, that um, that is just our ability to stop someone from speaking at the dais. Um, it does not mean that the person who is making slanderous comments isn't li potentially liable to the person who's you know the victim of those comments um, to bring a slander claim in in civil court. Um, and then um, beyond that, of course, just because we uh, don't, as you know, staff or the board, don't respond to a comment um, immediately, it doesn't mean, of course, that we agree with the um, tenor or um, substance of the of the comment um, and it's just really part of the Brown Act's process where we accept that you know, the comments are made um, we potentially can respond but even if we uh, don't respond it doesn't mean that we're we're agreeing with what what's being said I'd be happy to answer any questions the board has any questions um, we talked about also whether or not it, it's if somebody's making comments on multiple um, items, I want to encourage that. But if, if it takes a lot of the time of the meeting, uh, so you, you mentioned there might be um, agencies that that allow a certain amount of time for the first comment, and then lesser amounts and for. Correct, and there's other agencies that will dedicate on specifically contentious items a certain amount of time um, that's split among those wishing to, to speak or more times on certain topics and others. And if the board's interested in exploring those options, um, we can certainly agendize a discussion for a future meeting. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to. Just to, you know, so we have a plan. And one thing I've heard is that the... Uh, County um, supervisors meetings has changed their parliamentary procedure in just that way. They've, I think, decided that their consent agenda, you can speak on the whole consent agenda once and you have your three minutes, but you can't speak on each individual item. So, yes. So that's another way to deal with it, these kind of things. Right. And the city actually doesn't allow um, the public to pull consent agenda items I've heard that too they require that a council member do that the item. yes so somebody communicates with the council member right yeah yeah I don't I don't know that we need to do that but but those are possibilities yeah, yeah. okay all righty um, any comment on the district council report seeing none we don't have any conditional or unconditional will serves that's 6.1 so we go to 6.2 which is a receive 2019 year in review yeah so 2019 was a pretty darn good year for Soquel Creek Water District I'm just hoping um, maybe uh, go to the slideshow point and well written uh, well written article in the Plus times that also covered these same yeah and you know I tell you the truth the, I in even though my name is pinned to that memo I took a lot from the article that Melanie and Becca wrote so credit where credits due uh, and 
what's being handed out to you um, is just a little token of staff's appreciation. Um, it's a, a candle with salt in it, so somehow we felt that was right. You can burn <laughs> away the salt, maybe. Um, can you take yeah, the salt out of the candle? Take the salt out of the candle. We're trying to take the salt out of the water. Uh, but going to the first slide, you know, I'll start in 2018. Don't, don't criticize me for it, please. But it really did propel us and launch us into 2019. And if you remember back in late December, this was a title that came out. And that first paragraph, Shelly, can, can you read that? I mean, of this article, just I remember seeing that. It really kind of set the stage. Oh, you're making it smaller. Maybe I can, I can read it. You, do you want me to read it up there? Yeah, if you can. <laughs> if you can, that'd be awesome. It says, Capitola. Um, in the court of public oh, there you go. Okay. Nearly out of the ballpark. Yeah, and, and they said that because of all the uh, people coming, I think there were like 30 or 40 people in the crowd that night uh, speaking in favor of the project. The thing that really struck me the next morning was the environmental project. And I, I guess you could say I'm a, probably an environmentalist at heart. And we hadn't, we hadn't thought about the project that way. Even though it's a recycled project, this is all about Pure Water Soquel. And this set, this was a you know somebody else saying that and that's the way they branded it so it really kind of changed our my, my thinking of that it made me realize that so anyway with that we had a nice launch into 2019 19. which what are we doing here um, this one shows on CTV so you see all the oh okay so, so it's not a full you want to pull this up? You, can you, you mind sitting here and helping with this? I can stand. You just do, run that if you don't mind. So, Is that better? Oh, yeah, that's a great launch. You can't, but you can't do something like this and what we do without complete yeah. dedication up and down the line from customers to the board. And we'll start with the board. Uh, I don't think many people realize what y'all do up there. So 19 board meetings, 12 district committee meetings, six mid-county groundwater agency meetings, six sustainability plan meetings, and some of those were long, 10 Santa Cruz LAFCO meetings, uh, zone five meetings, 19 uh, meetings to set the agenda, one trip to Sacramento, one trip to Washington, D.C., both those yielding great dividends on investment, and at least five educational uh, conferences and countless, countless uh, community events. So day in, day out, I mean, look at that. Look at the days involved there. So our, our appreciation for that. However, let's, I think we need to go to the next slide. It, it, that's, that's where, that's the guiding star. You guys are the guiding star, mm -hmm. but it, it doesn't get done without a robust uh, staff that's fully engaged. And that's why in 2019, we were so stoked to receive one of the uh, top workplace awards and in the Bay Area. I mean, this is kind of, in, in my mind, one of the, um, the, the jewels that you go after to, because it talks to staff engagement, which is really the, the key in our minds to uh, a high performing uh, organization. So next slide, please. And so here are a couple pictures. Uh, there, we're putting in a, a water line, I assume, up top there, but we're not all work. We're some play. There are people in their uh, October 31st uniforms on the lower left, like <laughs> down there. Some participation on the right. Uh, so we're not all work. We do have fun. Next slide, please. And then here, just more, you know, like I said, staff engagement is the key. And so while we do do work, we try to make it fun. You can see the slide on the left there. Uh, and just smiles on people's faces, outreach on the left with our customers, uh, outreach events on the right, uh, just staff working but also enjoying themselves and if we can get that combo right we'll do wonderful things next slide please so 
We had four new hires. On your left, we, we stole Nick from Scotts Valley, I believe, and uh, thank you, Perret. He's, he's a wonderful addition. Greg came to us from the private sector with quite the analytical background. Super stoked to get him. Skyler, uh, he's a, um, where are you from? Cal Poly, uh, but also uh, attended the Bren School in um, Santa Barbara and then has some experience in construction and environmental projects. He's going to, uh, he's a super asset. And then we rounded out uh, recently with just an amazing individual, Eric. He, he comes to us really wanting to enter the uh, water uh, industry and as, as a veteran serving on our behalf overseas. So quite the uh, new additions there and uh, they're just fitting in wonderfully. Along with those hires though, we had some people leave. KC uh, uh, took off after a mere 30 something years, I believe. John put in over 10. Is that right, Tracy? You give me the 35 look. 35, okay, it's hard to keep track. I, I can't even count that high. <laughs> Bob, 50, right? And then uh, we also have new additions. There's Alyssa, she's on maternity leave right now, and that's a wonderful thing. And then there's her uh, newborn, quite the precious child. So it is, it is about the people to make it done, get it done, and this is what we're trying to get done. You know, it's about having a reliable, safe, sustainable water supply for now and the future. And we don't have that right now. And I know that's what some of the board members have been on uh, the board for over 15 years, approaching 20, trying to make that happen. And, and we're doing that. And with that in mind, uh, you know, the community water plan is a plan by the community for the community. And it really has four strong components. Water conservation is core, it's so core, we almost don't even talk about it because it's just part of us now. This, however, is stormwater recharge. And that's a, it, while it's a small component of our uh, portfolio, it may be help long, long term. And the board's committed to that. And here is some work being done to help uh, uh, identify some sites where we might be able to take some stormwater. And of course, we all know it has multiple benefits of uh, reducing some flooding and maybe some uh, water quality. Uh, resolutions and of course uh, you heard about water transfers tonight while they're not going quite as well as we had hoped uh, right now we do believe they'll have a, a, a position in our long-term long-term portfolio and here's some pictures of the valve and the piping that actually connects SoCal to Santa Cruz and we can send water each way so we're excited about that and our partnership with the uh, city of Santa Cruz is, is just awesome. And their jars below are uh, water quality is paramount. I'll say it, I'll say it every time. And uh, this was jar testing of um, the mixing of the water. It's turned out to, to look okay at this, uh, at this uh, state in the game, um, which is great, but we'll continue to do that and uh, never let up on the gas pedal on making sure we're providing only the highest quality water. Next one. Uh, kind of the main driver in our uh, portfolio resilience is Pure Water Soquel, and we've made tremendous grounds on all front on that, but I think this picture, to me, summed up the collaboration. There are all kinds of people in here from State Water Boards, City of Santa Cruz, Friends of the River, customers, uh, State Water Board themselves, members up there. And this is upon the uh, granting of the, the board approving the $50 million grant to, uh, for the Pure, Pure Water SoCal project. That was years in the making. My hat goes off to Melanie here. She, it couldn't have been done without her. It took a team, but she was the driver. Um, this is in addition to the 50. They also had to add a special addition to the memo to, in, to up for a $36 million low interest loan. So $86 million approved by the State Water Board in one fell swoop to the to SoCal Creek Water Districts. That's to our customers. And it's not just the money, it's the belief and the support in the project and that we're going the right way. They know our problem, they understand our problem. They say we're a smaller agency with a huge problem. So. That's our community water plan and the way we're going about it, solving the uh, water shortage issue and seawater intrusion. 
customers are paramount and on the left you're seeing the uh, on the right is a meter the older meters we're replacing with the meters on the left this is the automated meter of infrastructure we had about half of that done in 2019 it's exciting to see what's gonna happen in 2020 on that front Shelley uh, but it, really that's a customer service device that's where people are gonna be able to look at their phones and know oh I'm out of bounds or I'm approaching a certain tier or that sort of thing so again we're stoked about that and in 2019 besides uh, having rates approved uh, through a long process that that was a year or longer building up to it and then approved in uh, early 2019 uh, we got the uh, financial awards again. This is just one example. We hadn't filled in the little uh, uh, quarter 2019 on the lower left, but it's coming uh, along with a couple other awards. So uh, our financial department, you know, they don't say a lot, but they're back there and they're solid as a rock. And we so appreciate that, um, that we can count them on that in that way. Again, uh, we would be nothing if we didn't keep our infrastructure strong. And so here's some pictures of just day in, day out work being done. You can see the long pipeline cut in the road there, uh, crews, uh, all sorts of things going on in this picture. So infrastructure will always be kind of really the backbone of what we have to keep going. You know, the state overall or the nation has a D plus in infrastructure, which um, I think we're better in that, but we need to be even better than we are. Uh, agencies across the, the state and the United States are now realizing they're at that inflection point where they have to invest large sums of money to, to catch up. Uh, we believe in transparency at its core. We were the first in the county to receive this transparency award. It was great to see the water department, I mean, uh, one of the fire departments just got their first one recently. I think we've done this for three or four years, Melanie. Uh, and there's uh, the uh, California Special Districts Association rep uh, there uh, uh, giving the award to the, the board. So we'll continue uh, along those lines as we always have. Um, and I think, you know, it wouldn't be fair, or we wouldn't feel right without uh, bringing Vi up in 2019. Um, hopefully, uh, the not the memory but the pain of all that will ease in 2020 and there she is in all her glory uh, with that groundwater model that I fell in love with when I first came here after studying hydrology I was like why didn't they have that in graduate school it, you know I would have understood that better than the com computer models we used there she is with the wheel of fortune up top and that uh, gracious smile that she had there so last slide so you know it's been a, uh, we've talked about the accomplishments and it's been a wonderful year. It, this kind of stuff that we're doing here at Soquel Creek Water District just does not get done without the support and involvement of customers, all our customers out there, whether they agree or disagree, at least are, are talking to us. The partners, whether it's the county, the city of Santa Cruz, uh, public works in the county, uh, water departments, uh, around it, the Mid-County Groundwater Agency, uh, various community members who are on our standing committees, that sort of thing, who, who continue to, to value uh, our groundwater resources and, and wanna work with us to uh, continue to provide this. And then uh, one more slide. So while 2019 was good, I'm really looking forward to 2020. I think it's gonna be even better. Big things coming and I'm excited. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. And, and thanks again for all the, not just the board staff, but all the management team, tireless hours. I mean, sometimes I'll leave late and, you know, I'll see lights on. Uh, there was a while there where I don't think, I, I was suspicious whether Leslie had a cot in there, was staying overnight. We're gonna charge her rent if, if, if she was too many nights in a row. Uh, all the team, I could go down, Taj, I mean, his, his regular is to put in long days. Melanie, of course, we know that she's a powerhouse. Christine, Shelly, I don't want to forget anybody, but the whole team. I mean, you've got an incredible management team that's, that 
is not just uh, educated and mm -hmm. smart, but they care. This is they, they love what they're doing, and I think it shows in the product. So thanks to all of y'all. Any public comment on this agenda item? Seeing none. 6.3, adopt resolutions for the Seawater Intrusion Control Fund loan. So, so as Ron mentioned in his presentation, the uh, State Water Resources Control Board has awarded us a $36 million low interest loan through the Seawater Intrusion Control Fund. And in order to get this underway, we need to have a couple of funding resolutions uh, authorized by the board. Um, one is the uh, reimbursement resolution that sets out the terms of how we will submit our invoices for for loan reimbursement and then the other one's the authorizing resolution giving the general manager or his designee the authority to to work with the state board on funding issues thanks for putting these together mm -hmm. any questions yeah are these standard resolutions these, these are standard you'll probably see they, these are standard for the um, SRF loans okay. um, I don't know if that's one that we'll go after or not but it's a standard uh, resolution that we have to say and the interest rate is it's really low right for i think i believe it's 1.3 is Does what that we change locked in with with conditions or is it um, not for the seawater intrusion control fund loan they locked in the interest rate at the time they awarded the funds in november wow. yeah that's different from WIFIA. WIFIA hasn't locked in our rate yet and they won't until we um until we close fantastic any other questions? Well, I'll make the motion we approve these public two. Comment. Oh, yeah, public comment. Thank you, and thank you, Director LeHue, for reminding him for public comment. Um, the, the duration of this loan, I believe, is 20 years. If that could be clarified, I would appreciate that. And. Um, also, this is a this is a big debt for your ratepayers. How will um, the how will this impact any future rate changes that I know you are looking at to possibly reduce your scheduled nine percent per year rate increases for the next three years? And um, again, there is the legal cloud hanging over on this issue. Thank you. Director Daniels, uh, President Daniels, uh, I think this these resolutions should probably be by roll call. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I move we adopt these two. Second. Roll call, please. Director LeHue. Yes. Vice President Lather. Yes. Director Jaffe. Yes. And President Daniels. Yes, so that passes unanimously. We go to item 6.4, consider approval of contract amendment for professional. Two of them, did we do them both? Or just I, them? I, I made the motion for oh, okay. both of them. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, consider approval of contract amendment for professional legal services related to Pure Water SoCal program. Any questions? Yes. On that? Oh, you want me to? Well, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that, uh, you know, we had a legal challenge by a pro per non customer mm -hmm. and that the judge ruled on. January 17th, uh, filed, um, no, no, on November 15th, the, the hearing of the merits of the trial court and issued a 17 page order denying in full the petition, the writ of mandate from the pro per. Um, now, um, and it's a, it, attachment one shows that court ruling. We, we feel it's a, you know, it ruled in favor of the district on all elements of the legal challenge brought against the district. Judge Small wrote a, a well-reasoned 17-page point-by-point decision which denied the petitioner's request on the writ of mandate on all accounts. So no, most significantly though, what it did for us is it, it, val it upheld the validity of the district's EIR and, and gave us um, even more comfort that we had done it the right way. Uh, and on another upside, it, it kind of brought us to grow, together. It made us stronger. So not only do we have a third party judge who had experience uh, in uh, some hydrology, he studied under a PhD hydrologist, I think he said, and he uh, interned under an environmental uh, judge, uh, listened to the case, considered it, and then wrote this 
page um, uh, order. And it, like I said, it gave us more confidence even though we thought we had done it right, now third-party verification and has brought us together closer as a team. On the downside, it's costing our customers because the petitioner is appealing it. And it, this alone, to defend this uh, appropriately to the benefit of our customers, it's in the memo. I forget the exact. As much as 175000 Well, that Well, now that's, it, it was that's 440 to defend the... Um, Oh, right. The, uh, and the four hundred forty thousand dollars to defend the EIR when the lawyer who has about I think thirty years of experience said normally it would cost one hundred seventy-five thousand. And if you look at that middle paragraph, you can see why it costs more than normal. Um, it says here there was an the enormous number of pleadings and other documents filed by the petitioner, 148, 11 hearings, and they required extensive uh, responses, written responses in court appearances. This included five ex parte applications, multiple case management hearings, and two judicial motions, uh, a motion to vacate a case order, and it goes on. I won't read them all. But the lawyer for BBK said this was um, probably the most uh, unusual she had seen in her 30 years, and that's stated in the attachment to this. So what that brings us to is the appeal, and what we're asking for tonight is even though an appeal would normally cost, I think they said around 75 to defend against because of the uh, previous patterns demonstrated by the petitioner we're uh, we're asking for the board to prove up to 175,000 to appropriately defend the uh, ongoing proceedings for the public and the environment it may come in less than that it may come in more we'll see but this is what we're requesting tonight and for the um, uh, to allocate it approve an allocation from the operating contingency reserve Okay, questions? No questions, public comment. Questions, questions, no? Okay, public comment, please. Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. I am the petitioner and now the appellant. And I am taking proper action because I care and because I am not alone in the feelings that there are big problems with this project. It is unnecessary, it is expensive, and the EIR was deficient. I took it pro per because I couldn't raise $100,000 to pay an attorney. I've learned a lot. But I have taken this action for public benefit I myself am not a customer, but it is the same aquifer that serves my water company. And it is the community that I love and care about that this water would affect. It is the community that I care about that depends on this aquifer. That y this project would inject problematic water into. There are many studies coming out regarding antibiotic-resistant DNA being found in Orange County in the aquifers. The reason I took so many actions was because <laughs> the judge was, should have um, disqualified himself but would not. I, I had to disqualify Judge Burdick, the one and only CEQA judge in this county, not because I didn't like what he said, which is what Ms. Ouellette claimed, it was because I had previous legal experience with him and he, I knew him that he, he could not act impartially with, with anything that I had to do. It was the Aptos Village Project case. That's why I had to disqualify him and that's why I wanted to get that case out of this county to Sacramento where there are four CEQA judges that could review it. Now, the, your attorney from Best Best and Krieger classified it as a limited civil case. You know better than that. 
I didn't until finally in January, Judge Volkman, the head of the presiding judge over the appellate division, which by definition, a limited civil case when it's appealed stays in this county and goes to the appellate division, he finally said, hey, this isn't a limited case. How come those judges didn't, those experienced judges, didn't see it before? How come your attorney from Riverside classified it as a limited case? It isn't. By definition, all CEQA cases are unlimited because they are complex. So that is why it's being transferred, and that's why I had to take so many actions because Judge Gallagher would not have recused himself, even though he had done so voluntarily. In Thank you. Anyone else? Seeing no one, bring it back to the board. I will make both motions. I'd like, I'll second, but I would like to make a comment. Yeah. yeah. Just this uh, DNA resistant bacteria, I've done some research on it. And it's not for this level of purification. It's for a much lower level of, of recycled water. Yep. So I just wanted to correct that. Thank you for clarifying. <coughs> there is no way for even a virus to get through a reverse osmosis membrane. There, that's a huge molecule, and it has to be um, more less than 150 molecular units. 80 Daltons? It's fear-mongering. Yep, it is. So, or just complete ignoring reality. Science? Yes. But, but once I heard that, that, that claim, I did do the research. Yep, thank you. Of course. And because I think that's part of what we're we're here for right to protect the of course that's why we've been so diligent about going to look at these and yeah. studying them and yeah and if I if I may it's all it's all waters I think that's what many people fail to, to understand I mean Orange County if anything that's scaring them right now are the PFAs uh, yes. that you know are, are an issue and that's in their groundwater it has nothing to do with recycled water yeah. so that's the recycled water is actually helping and uh, they just stated that but they're purified water so um, yeah it's all waters we need to remain diligent upon whether it's uh, you know for our customers mm -hmm. so we made a motion and second on this mm -hmm. yes okay roll call please would we need to roll call this or no I guess we don't all in favor Aye. 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 No opposed? Nobody? Okay, that unanimous. So we now we're going to go to a closed session with our legal counsel. Anyone wish to comment on this? Yes, I do. Thank you. Becky Steinbrunner, the appellant. Um, you don't have to turn your back on me, Chairman Daniels. Um, the reason I'm appealing is because I was barred from making many arguments during the um, hearing on the case on the merits because Judge Small denied my ability to amend my petition. Judge Small denied my ability to get the case out of the county. Judge Small denied my ability to get a um, continuance to try to get information that had been three times postponed from Department of Water Resources regarding information I requested during with a Public Records Act request that I needed for my argument in court. And ultimately, Judge Small denied the petition for writ of mandate. During the hearing, um, there were many arguments that I made, but your counsel argued that I could not bring them up because I had not, uh, they were not in my petition. I had not been allowed to correct or amend my petition by the judge's denial that very morning, same morning. So the reason I'm appealing is because I need to do that. And I have support of many people in the community to move forward with this. and. Most are very glad <laughs> that it was finally recognized that it should go to the Sixth District, the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, where I hope I will have a better chance of getting it before a judge familiar and experienced with environmental law. 
None of the judges that have heard this case to date have that experience. Saying that you have helped out an environmental professor in graduate school 40 years ago when CEQA was just very nascent in my book does not make you an experienced CEQA judge. And that is what Judge Small said. And I'm not casting dispersions on the fairness of the judges. What I am saying is that CEQA law and interpretation of it is very complex. And to be fair to all parties, it really commands a, that the material go before a judge who is familiar and seasoned, especially with water law. And that's what I'm seeking. So I don't anticipate having to take many, many actions. There was only really one case. Time's up. Thank you. Anyone else? Seeing no one, bring it back to the closed session, which will start now. Yeah. Let's see. Candle. Is it a candle?